hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comments section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here. Might not, don't know. How's everybody doing tonight? Good? Wow, it has been a wonderful year, uh, 2021. I know many people uh, have viewed this year as a year of hardship, which it has been. There's been a lot of hard things that, that have occurred, but I'm choosing to look at the positives of what God has done in our church and in our Christian life this past year alone. Uh, I'm so excited. You need to tune in two weeks from tonight to our online television program. Alan and I are planning on uh, filming that tomorrow, so be praying about that. It's a 28, well, 30-minute long program, two minutes in commercials, and 28 minutes in content. So really looking forward to that. Uh, but in that, I will, I will tell you these statistics in uh, since, well, actually, during this year, God has blessed us with uh, 27 additions to our church, and 12 of those have been professions of faith by baptism. Um, and I think that God is just getting started for what he's going to do and hopefully continue to do in 2022. Uh, so we are really excited about that, really looking forward to what God is going to do. I want to go over the, the sermon series that we actually did in 2021. You might have forgotten some of these, but here are some of the series we did this past year. We started off with Remember Sermon Series, which was verse by verse in 2 Peter. Then we went to a Servanthood Sermon Series on Wednesdays. Then we went, uh, well, this is the incorrect order, but we had a, uh, well, no, this isn't, a Sufficient Shepherd Sermon Series when we went verse by verse in the 23rd Psalm. Then we went to Crowning Christ. Uh, Wednesday nights we had People of Prayer. And then uh, our most recent Sunday series before this past one was Desperate Times Equals Desperate Measures. And then Kingdom Fighter Sermon Series, which we still have to finish up the last Wednesday in January, which we will. And then tonight, we're actually going to finish up Christmas through the eyes of those who lived it. So this is our last sermon for the year. Some of you are so excited. Some of you might be sad, don't know. But um, I'm sad, but at the same time, I'm good to have a uh, little bit of a break, uh, but looking forward to next year as well. I want to go over some prayer requests, prayer concerns with you tonight. As far as COVID, keep praying for Sandy Poole. Was today the last day of quarantine, Randy? Okay, today was Sandy's last day, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, keep praying for Sherry Miller. Her last day of quarantine is Saturday, uh, but she has been able to continue her radiation cancer treatments, even with having COVID. So that was a huge praise, something she was worried about, something God already went ahead and took care of that, like he always does. Um, as far as hospital goes, have a few updates for you. Uh, Tommy Furtick, Sr., went to the hospital today. Um, he, i tell you the truth, uh, Tommy Jr. told me, that his oxygen levels dropped and they didn't know why. So out of caution, they took him to the hospital. Um, he's still there. Uh, last I was told that late this afternoon, he was still in the ER and they hadn't got him in a room yet. They do want to keep him overnight. The reason they want to do that is for observation. They want to try to figure out why his levels dropped. Because uh, from what I was told, he had a really good morning this morning. So they didn't really know what was going on. They hadn't been able to figure it out. But they've got him stable. He's fine now. They just want to figure it out. Um, so pray for them as they try to do that. Um, Janice Willits is actually no longer in the hospital. She's been moved to extended care in Lexington. 
She can still not have visitors. She cannot have visitors until Monday the 20th. Um, and I will get you that information as soon as it is given to me. I know some of you would like to try to see her. Um, Lee Willits is still in the hospital and he's still on the eighth floor, uh, the COVID floor, because I uh, really pray for him. He, he's okay. Uh, Stacy told me he's all right. If you would like to uh, call him, you can, but he doesn't really answer the phone a lot because, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention that. He he really can't talk according to Stacy. Um, he's I can't remember his room number, but the email was sent out about that information. He does have staph pneumonia, and he also had a bacteria infection too. So uh, be praying for Lee as he's going through uh, that situation and then in the days to come. Uh, don't forget Sonia Ganey and Billy Callahan are still in rehab. Visited with Billy today. Uh, I got in trouble because I, I let him walk and I wasn't supposed to, apparently. And the nurse called us. And uh, I was helping Billy move. And apparently Billy wanted me to walk him right out of there. And uh, he said, he said, why don't we go walk down the hall? I said, okay. Nurse comes up and says, what are you doing? And, and Billy goes, oh, my son's taking me out of here. I said, I'm not his son. I'm not his son. And the lady goes, well, who are you? I said, I'm his pastor. And she goes, now I know you're lying. <laughs> and, then, and Billy's just sitting there. He's just laughing, laughing, laughing. Finally get him in the room, get him calmed down. And I said, Billy, I mean, my face was red as it is now. I said, Billy, why did you do that to me? He went, I got a kick out of that. I said, hey, if you enjoy that, guess what? That, it was worth it. it was worth, I don't know if I'll be able to go back to NHC, but oh well. But uh, Billy's a hoot. Oh, man, he's hilarious. Uh, but you can go see him. He's in room 329 if anybody would like to see him. I know Mike went and saw him last week. He does get tired. He, he's usually out of rehab every day after 11. But, man, <laughs> if you want to laugh, that's where you need to go. Um, so prayer requests. Be praying for Marilyn Callahan, Billy's wife she is having surgery on her foot this upcoming tuesday december 21st talked with her actually i ran into her as she was i was leaving she was coming in and so they the doctor let her know um that she can't have any visitors other than adam who's taking her so nobody can go the day of her surgery but be praying for her be praying for jeanette spires who is having another surgery um to clean up her artery on this side which is going to be December the 29th, unless that changes. Uh, be praying for Gail Woodruff, who is going to have surgery in the month of January, but be praying for her eyesight and just some other things that she mentioned to me today. Just keep her in your prayers. Uh, keep lift up, lifting up Marion Marks in your prayers as he's having some tests and some scans done. And Marion, do not leave without your polo shirt. It's been in my office for a week. I need to give it to you, your polo shirt. Yeah, yeah. But do, don't, let, don't leave without that. It's, it's in there. Uh, keep lifting up Robbie Stabler. He's still recovering from bronchitis and everything, so be praying for him. Also, uh, be praying for my mom. Uh, she uh, t uh, texted me today. Uh, well, actually, she called me. I, I mean, I was kind of startled because, you know, usually she doesn't call me unless something's wrong or something, um, a.k.a. me not answering her text, forgetting to respond. She thinks something's wrong. Uh, but anyway, so uh, she is sick. She's been throwing up since 3 a.m. yesterday. We have no idea why. And the reason that's the problem is because my grandmother's birthday is on Friday. And we're having my grandmother's birthday party tomorrow night. So I don't know who's going to be in charge of the party if mom's down. Uh, hopefully I won't be in charge because I'm not very good at that. Anyway, so be praying for mom. Also, be praying for Donna Fogel. Uh, visited with Donna Fogel today. Uh, last Friday, Donna went to the doctor, and her doctor, you know, last year she had COVID, and the doctors told her that there was nothing else that they could do for her lungs and for her diabetes. They're still going to continue the treatment that they've already been doing for her, but this was extremely discouraging for her because there's nothing else new that they can do. And in the last three months, her diabetes have really taken a toll on her and her body. So uh, be praying for Donna. Had a great visit with she and Sandy today. I know they're watching. We love you guys. We're praying for you guys. Um, and if you have time, um, feel free to send them a card. Feel free to give them a call. Um, and if you'd like to schedule a visit with them, I know they'd love that too. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, keep lifting up Matt Rucker in your prayers. Um, he's still in ICU, um, is from what Colette told me yesterday. Uh, keep lifting up Lynn Barber in your prayers. And also Ed Smith, which is Terry Smith's husband. Um, not Ed Dorowski, Ed Smith. Um, and he is having diabetic blisters on his legs. Um, so be praying for him. Uh, speaking of Miss Colette and several others uh, that I got to hang out with yesterday, if we could show those pictures of Operation Christmas Child, if you have never gone to serve and work at the Operation Christmas Child uh, thing in Charlotte, the distribution center, you need to go. Uh, we had an awesome time. I had never been before, and I'm very thankful that Colette called. There, there's my shower cap um, to protect my hair. Uh, I, had a, I had a hat, just kidding. Uh, there's Glenn, he's working hard. Uh, so it's really cool. So kind of how it works is you get the boxes. So when we sent our boxes, they went to Swansea Baptist, and then Swansea Baptist took them to Charlotte, and they get them in these boxes, and there's inspectors. So our inspectors were Colette, Sonny Gale, and Cheryl. And so they inspect it, make sure that all the good stuff's in there. Cheryl had me inspect one box, but inspecting just really wasn't my thing. Uh, just wasn't good at it. But anyway, and then you had the professional tapers, okay? Glenn and I were tapers, and it was really cool because you could actually get the box. You could try to do it super fast, super fast, super fast. And I really liked doing that. And then two other people on our team had to leave because they worked at Wells Fargo, and they had to go. And, you know, Wells Fargo had them do a volunteer day kind of thing. And so they had this little scanner that you had to like scan the boxes as they're coming down the line because a lot of people track where their box goes. I don't know if anybody did that, but you could do that. So you got to do the scanner, and then you got to lift up these heavy boxes and put them on the, on the belt. And, I mean, I'm sure you can go ahead and guess who lifted the boxes. They were heavy. They were heavy. Well, yeah, 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 Colette too, but um, if you would like to do that, I think they still, do you still have spots for tomorrow? Yes. Yes, you will receive a blessing. Get in to be a part of this. It was a lot of fun. I recommend it. Uh, I will do it next year, but I'm retired for this year. Uh, I don't know if I can do it again this year. It's very tiring. Uh, but you do need to go do it. It's a lot of fun. And then on this past Monday night, if we could show that group picture, uh, so nine of us from First Baptist Gaston, our spiritual warriors is our senior adult ministry. And it's a lot of fun. I'm not a senior adult, but I went. And so this is actually Hillcrest Baptist Church of Williamston. Last time I said Hillcrest, people got confused, thought I was talking about Gaston. Hillcrest Baptist Church, Williamston. So we actually traveled up there, and that was their senior adult Christmas party. And they invited us because we actually hung out with them at the beach. So when we had our senior adult retreat at the beach, um, we hung out with those guys. And they're a lot of fun. So we were able to go to their Christmas party. There were nine of us, including Hannah and I. You can see some of our seniors there. So we're going to do this again next year. And Vicki even mentioned inviting them to come to us. So would really, really uh, encourage you, if you are a senior adult, get involved in our Spiritual Warriors Senior Adult Ministry. Every Wednesday night, the first Wednesday, not Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday afternoon, we have 11.45 a.m. lunch, the first Wednesday of every month. I encourage you to be a part of that, but also some different trips and fun things that we do when we plan for our seniors. Senior adult ministry is so much fun. I've done pretty much every age group of ministry, and senior adults is probably my favorite as of right now. It could change, uh, but it's, that's a lot of fun. We had so much fun. We played Dirty Santa with 64 people. We left, I think, at like 10 o'clock. I mean, we didn't get, I didn't get back to my apartment until 1.30. So that, that's how much fun we had. It was a lot of fun. But, hey, be a part of that ministry. Several announcements. It's 10 days till Christmas. Do you believe that? 10 days. I did some Christmas shopping today. Uh, and, you know, when you're doing Christmas shopping, I saw some things I liked so much, I got them for myself, too. So, <laughs> anyway... That's why you don't go to the Gamecock bookstore. Don't do that. Um, anyway, December the 19th is coming Sunday. We have our Christmas musical at 11 a.m., The Glorious Reality of Christmas. And then uh, we'll go ahead and let you know this. At the conclusion of that service, we're going to have two things. Um, well, one thing, really. 
So, uh, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering March is Sunday morning. So, we're going to do a march. We're not passing plates. And instead of putting the baskets on the pews and having people bend over and, and all that kind of stuff, we're actually going to have angels up here holding the baskets. Our, our, little, our children are dressing up as angels. So, they're going to hold the baskets for you. So, during our missions march, you come up, you give your Lottie Moon Christmas Offering to one of the angels in their little baskets. And we'll make sure that gets to international missions. And then also, um, the way it worked out, you know, there's so many Christmas events and things. So my granddad's side of the family are having our annual Christmas lunch at 1.30 in Traveler's Rest. So I'm not going to be able to get there at 1.30, but I did promise him I would get there as soon as possible. So Hannah and my sister are supposed to be with us. So if you guys don't mind, instead of shaking hands that week, you can shake hands with all our actors and everybody in costume and things like that. But I'm going to get out of my costume, and we're just going to go because I really need to get there on time. I don't get to see that side of the family except once a year. So unless we have any objections, that's what I plan on doing. So... Uh, really looking forward to seeing them. Not nothing against anybody. I just got to get on the road um, and see that family. Um, next week in here, do want to encourage you to come next week uh, because we'll be reading the Christmas story to our children. I've got a few questions I plan on asking them about the Christmas story. I'm sure Samson's going to have a lot of answers for me, and I can't wait to hear those and others. Uh, every child gets a candy cane. Every child will, will spread out on the floor and on the steps and everything. And Hannah's going to be with us, and she's going to read part of the story as well. And then after that, that'll be a short time, and we'll go over uh, for refreshments in the fellowship hall. Yes. Yes. Do not bring anything except yourself. How about that? No desserts, nothing. You can bring me a Dr. Pepper, but that's it. Nothing else. I shouldn't have drank one before I got out here. Okay. Um, and don't forget, this coming Sunday, you can start picking up those widow baskets or widower, if you're a widow or widower. And uh, see Chris Fadreen if you'd like to deliver some of those to our widows. Yes. Okay, be praying for Chris Fadreen fell at work. Okay. Um, don't forget December 29th, there will be no service. And then on um, January 2nd will be our Vision Sunday. So, all right, any prayer requests you have? Okay, is that, um, is that the same family that... Uh, Bobby served with my dad. Okay, that's not your sis. Okay. Okay. It's Terry's brother-in-law, family. Anybody else? Okay, Jeremy Dugan. All right, is in the hospital with COVID. So be praying for Jeremy Dugan. Anybody else? June Ott? Any relation? Okay. Cousin, okay. Thank you for that, Ronnie and Susan. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. Savannah Peel's father was diagnosed with Parkinson's about a year ago, so be praying for him. All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, that we can worship you tonight in the fullness of who you are. Lord, I pray that as we look at the wise men and King Herod and that story, Lord, in Scripture, that we will learn a lot uh, to help us in our walk with you. We lift up all these prayer requests that we've mentioned by name and even those that weren't mentioned and some that were unspoken. We love you, Father, and we pray that, pray that you bless this time in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, as Glenn and our instrumentalists are coming to get ready to lead us in worship, I want to read for you an opening scripture from Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. And we're actually going to read this tonight. 
But I'll go ahead and read this verse. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So if you would, um, please stand as we get ready to sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. Okay. I'm not singing a solo. I'm just using the microphone. And I was going to play the guitar, but that's the wrong kind that I use. Um, it's the kind that's got strings on it, so I can't play it. <laughs> Megan's going to play for us after a while. <clears throat> tonight I'm so sorry I started and then I couldn't start singing <laughs> there we go a book was written long ago about a man that we all know a prophet claimed he would change the world born into a virgin girl in a dirty bar in a promised land was the son of God and the son of man. She looked at him and called him Jesus. There in the hills of Bethlehem, no one had any room for them. They 
shepherds watched their flocks nearby when an angel appeared in the sky told him not to be afraid the messiah was born today not in a palace lined with gold you'll find him in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes and when they did they bowed before him there in the hills of Bethlehem no one had any room for them they knew that child was a real Lying there in a king size manger. Amen. For those online, I was just telling Megan that uh, I just love that song, the words of that song, and I was really hoping you weren't going to end anytime soon, but <laughs> like any good thing, it has to come to an end. Okay, if you got a copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn to Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter. Last sermon of the year, when psychology and theology meet. When psychology and theology meet. Spent way too much time trying to come up with that title. But anyway, uh, we are in a series, the last and final message in this series, entitled Christmas Through the Eyes of Those Who Lived It. And if you've been with us every message or you caught some of them online, Sunday morning when you see our musical, you're going to be like, oh, well, I heard about that character. I remember that because all of this... This entire six-week series was done in parallel with our Christmas musical that you're going to see Sunday. There's something powerful about continuity. So that's what we're doing this coming Sunday. You'll be excited about that. Last Sunday, this past week, what did we talk about? Well, we talked about God's providence through precious people. We talked about precious parents. talked about precious person number one being Simeon and precious person number two being Anna. And I really enjoyed that. I hope that you did. But when psychology and theology meet, the sermon in a sentence is this. By looking at the narrative of these, of the narrative of these wise men, we can learn life lessons when psychology and theology meet, such as some people seek the Savior. Some people oppose the Savior. Some people scheme others. Some people save, savor the, the Savior's presence. And some people sabotage Satan's plans. Psychology, by definition, is the scientific study of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a given context. Theology, by definition, is simply the study of God. There are many biblical narratives where psychology and theology are both prevalent. We see that a lot in Scripture because God created the human mind. But in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, that distorted the human mind for the rest of history until we're made whole in, uh, when we go to meet Jesus face to face if you are saved. But this passage that we're looking at deals with wise men who see this star... And they follow it to the Savior. 
But as we'll look at in a moment, somebody arises, an antagonist, if you will, to try to deceive them, to try to get them off. And that's where a lot of the psychology of this comes. But the star was actually prophesied by Balaam in Numbers 24, 16 through 17. We'll look at that in just a moment. But I remember as a kid, it would aggravate me so much because my grandmother, my Jojo, she majored in psychology. And she got a, a four-year degree in it and a master's degree in it. So, you know, psychology is great, but every decision you make as a child when your grandmother wants to break it down and figure out why you did what you did, every single situation, it gets old. I remember I'd get in the car. This was in the fourth grade, and I was talking to this girl outside of the car. I was not one of those boys that was bashful. I just said what I felt, same way I am now. Good thing and a bad thing. But she's the same way, so she can't say anything. But anyway, I get in the car, and she said, well, why were you talking to that girl? I don't know. I was talking to her. No, why? Think about it. Why? And I said, I, was, I don't know. Why did you just say, I don't know? I don't know. <laughs> so she did this deep psychology study on me. And every time I go home, you know, after she comes to church, you know, I, I saw her one Sunday. She was sitting right there, and I thought she was taking notes. And we took her to Grecian Gardens, and I said, wow, you were taking notes. And she went, yeah, about your mannerisms, your body movement, uh, why you were doing what you were doing, why you said what you said, the way you said it. I was just like, oh, gosh. And she's training Hannah up the same way. Like a mini Jojo all over. My mom and I are not like that. We are not that way. We're not wired that way. But hey, it is what it is. And it might not have been my favorite thing, but as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate it more. Because how are we as Christians to grow in Christ if we don't look at our own motives and why we are wired the way we are wired and why we do what we do? See, psychology is important in the Christian life. It's the study of the human mind. If you really want to get rid of those pet sins or those strongholds of sin in your life, figure out why you crave it the way that you do. And that encompasses and goes along with theology, which is a study of God. And I think in order for us to foster a mindset of spiritual growth that encompasses and encapsulates Romans 12, 1 through 2, being transformed, not conformed, then I think we must be willing to have, or we must have a willingness to look at our own mental processing system, MPS, I guess, and as to how God's Word can change and mold that. So if you do have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, as we look at the last message of the year when psychology and theology meet. If you are physically able, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star appeared when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Go back to verse 3 and circle the word troubled. I'm going to do a, a word study on that. Circle that word troubled. Verse 5, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And O you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What scripture is he referencing? What is that scripture parallel to? Micah 5, 2. Micah 5, 2. Verse 7, when Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right. Okay. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, also underlined, and going into the house. 
They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, franken- gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you will teach us tonight lessons that we can learn about the human mind, about ourselves, as well as, as, well as about yourself and the characteristics of you. We love you, Father. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, you may be seated. The first, or the question I want to ask you is what are several lessons? What are several lessons that we can learn about the human mind and the study of God himself directly from this passage? The first lesson I think we can gain from this is some people seek the Savior. Some people seek the Savior. Some people want to find Jesus. You wanted, hopefully tonight, you came seeking the Savior. You came to worship Him. The wise men, they came to seek the Savior. God can use anything that He wants to get our attention or to focus or realign ourselves to Him. God can use science for the scientist, literature and books for the student, work for a businessman. But here, God gets the attention of astrologers from the eastern lands who drop what they were doing and they seek the Savior. I want you to think about this. If you look at verse 11, it says, And going into the house, Jesus was born in a manger in a barn, not a house. All of a sudden they have a house. It shows us here that some time has passed. There's been some time. It's believed it could have been anywhere from six months to two years after Jesus was born that the wise men got there. We don't know the exact time, but it was probably somewhere in those parameters. So what does that mean? Well, that means that these wise men who were wealthy, they were scientists of their day when it came to the star. And notice how God got their attention with a star. He, he went to their interest, what they like to do. They dropped what they were doing, and they sought the Savior. I want you to see this too. That word troubled in verse 3, I don't think Herod would have gotten all out of whack if just three people showed up. I think he got out of whack because there was a caravan. Now, I don't know that for sure. I cannot prove that. Scripture does not say that. But why do we always assume that there were three Yeah, the song. And David Platt wrote an article about how theologically incorrect that song is. Because the scripture never tells us that there were three. It does tell us about gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Which would automatically assume three. But it doesn't say there were three wise men. So I think that's very interesting to go ahead and point out at the forefront. They were seeking the Savior. We do not know how many of them there were. And if they were wealthy and they were traveling that far... I would assume they had some people with them. I would assume that. There's a a book that I read a few weeks ago that said uh, the the pastor should take at least one person everywhere he goes. I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. Sometimes you got to have time to breathe. But I do believe 85% of the time you should do that. 15% of the time you should go to Chick-fil-A by yourself. Anyway, I haven't had any of this. No, yeah, we did. Yesterday I did. At Operation Christmas Child. Ah, she caught me. Okay. But who are these wise men? Because we really don't know that much about them if we're honest. We know that they are called wise men because the Greek word that is used to describe them is magi. Magi, also known as magi, which means translated wise men. So I want to go through what we know about them, what we don't know about them. What do we not know about the wise men? Obviously the number. There could have been three, ten, thirty. We don't know. But it's likely that it was more than three. We also don't know their names. Okay, Scripture does not tell us their names. But there's some interesting sources out there. And this, none of this is scriptural. So do not take any of this to the bank. But there are some non canonical Jewish history writings that tell us that their names could have possibly been Melchon, Belf. Belshazzar, not Belshazzar, but Belshazzar, Cesar, and Gaspar. Those are three of the names that Jewish history has actually given us. And according to other traditions, it is believed that one was Ethiopian, one was Indian, and one was Greek. Now, can't prove any of this, but I do think it's kind of cool to, to look at those possibilities. Now, what do we know about the wise men? We know their, their origin, where they came from. 
They came from east of Jerusalem. East of Jerusalem. We don't know their specific origin, but we do know some tangible possibilities. Some tangible possibilities about where they possibly could have come from have been Babylon, Persia, Egypt, and possibly the Arabian Desert. Those are just some possible ways. What about their prestige? We also know that about them. These guys would have been high-ranking officials which would support the claim of them coming as a caravan and not three separate guys. If somebody's important, he's going to bring an army, okay? A.K.A. the President of the United States has a whole Social Security system. Not Social Security system. <laughs> if you're watching online, I'm sorry. You miss all the fun. Secret service. That's my last sermon of the year. Give me grace. <laughs> but they were astrologers. They were one who studied the stars and they were drawn to the star that God had placed in the sky to worship the Christ. So let's look at that. Verse 2. Significance of the star in verse 2. They say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Notice they say his star. They're already showing their belief in the Trinity. His star. Fully man, yet fully God. His star. I think that's interesting. But this reference, when they're talking about his star, because how would they know about this? Well, this reference actually takes us to the Old Testament book of Numbers, the 22nd chapter, where we see the story of Balak and Balaam unfold. While Israel, during this time, Israel was traveling closer to the Promised Land. You guys remember that? Because we just did a sermon series on that not too long ago. But when the Israelites were getting closer to the promised land, you know, at the end of the 40-year period, they're knocking on the doors. Actually, year 38 slash year 39, they're knocking on the door. And this alarmed Balak. And he's like, what? Because he was the king of Moab, the Moabites. And he's, I mean, he doesn't want them doing that, obviously. So, um, Balak actually hires or calls on Balaam. And Balaam was known as a magician of sorts who had come from the eastern mountains. Okay, let's see this. A magician of sorts. Sometimes magi can also be taken as a magician. These guys weren't magicians, but they were astrologers. But sometimes those word, words were synonymous, synonymous. But they, Balaam was also coming from the eastern lands. I think that's interesting too. So did the wise men. The wise men came from the, the eastern lands. And the most important thing is that he was supposed to curse the house of Jacob. So Balak is going to Balaam saying, Hey, I don't like these people. I don't want to get them close to me. You go to them and you curse them since you're a magician. Well, what actually happened? Well, God reveals to Balaam that he wanted him to bless the Israelites and not curse them, according to Numbers 22, verses 22 through 35. So Balaam, in Numbers 24, obeys God, and he decides to bless Israel. And I want you to check out his final blessing in Numbers 24, 16 through 17. The, oh, this is Numbers 24, 16 through 17. The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of sheep. Wow, that's really awesome. I spent a lot of time this morning praising God for how his word connects. That is a blessing. The promise that we see in this story in Numbers is that the one coming from the east and prophesying a star and a king among the Jews. In this passage, we see the fulfillment as the magi come from the east, follow the star, the king of the Jews. The star is, should still be the star in our life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can also see this prophecy in Isaiah 60, a prophecy about the Christ. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. It also shows the fulfillment of this prophecy. But I felt like with Balaam, it was really interesting. And we, when we talk about Herod's lineage in just a moment, I want you to remember that uh, Balaam was supposed to curse the house of Jacob. I'm going to save my thunder for a minute. Just remember that. Second lesson we can learn tonight. Some people oppose the Savior. Verses 3 through 6. 
you know what? Some people that you meet, they just don't like Jesus, okay? They just oppose the Savior. They don't like Him. But it's not always in what people say that shows that they oppose the Christ, but it's also how they live. In other words, put your money where your mouth is. I can talk about the Gamecocks all day long, but I'm not going to bet on them. Because as, as, as Eddie Knight and I have talked, I'm not good with predicting numbers at all. I lowball us every event we have. Anyway, so this is true of what we see here. What happens in verse 3? Herod is threatened. The English word that I ask you to circle, at least in the ESV uh, translation, not sure which translation you have, but verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. What is that word in the Greek? It's a word in the Greek, et eterachatha, eterachatha. I'm just going to spell it for you, okay? E-T-A-R-A-C-H-T-H-E. So that word in the Greek means to stir up in turmoil or terrified. I really like that word, terrified. And in turmoil, he was in turmoil with himself. Why is Herod afraid here? Herod is terrified because since 40 B.C., the Roman government gave him the area of Judea for him to be in control of. They said, hey, you're the boss. This is your area. Do what you're going to do. Since 40 B.C., he was in charge of this. But Herod had a problem that everything he did, he built it on the glorification of himself. This is where psychology comes into effect. Because people oppose God. They oppose Christ because there's some kind of psychology issue going on. There's some kind of issue in the brain. The main issue is that if you want to look at sin, all sin has the root of self. It all comes back to me. And Herod has that problem. Can you believe that Herod did, he has some major trust issue issues. I cannot imagine somebody doing this. But Herod felt like other people, from some things I read, historical things I read, he felt like he could not trust his wife or his children. So he killed them. That's what kind of person Herod was. He killed his wife and he killed some of his kids. He let some of them live. I couldn't understand that. But anyway, so he did this. So what you see at the end of chapter 2, when Herod has all of the babies in Bethlehem killed under the age of 2, I want you to re uh, remember too, Bethlehem was a really small town. So it is estimated that there were about 10 to 30 boys that would have been under age two. When I was younger, I thought it was a mass slaughter, but and that's still, human life is significant, but it's not as many as I was necessarily thinking. Still, 10 to 30, that's still a lot. So he had them killed because he wanted the Christ dead. He was threatened, so he was in turmoil with himself. I just want to ask you do, you, do you value yourself higher than you should? That's something you got to ask yourself daily. Because we, the, the Bible says we need to die to self daily. Herod didn't want to die to self. He wanted other people to die so he could promote himself. Now, hopefully, nobody that I know of, because you're all here, you'd be in jail if this were true, but hopefully none of you kill anybody that threatens you. But hopefully nobody threatens you because you just love everyone for who they are, not what they can give you. But who is this Herod guy? Well, like I said, he was also known as king of the Jews. And I think that's, that's really important when you think about the psychology part. If Herod was known by the people he was over as king of the Jews, when the um, wise men come into town saying, where's the king of the Jews? I'm sure Herod's first response was me. And when they say, no, we're looking for the baby, we're looking for the star, we're looking for the Christ, that immediately put up some red flags of psychology in Herod's mind. Well, there's another king of the Jews. And then flash forward to Calvary, about 31, 32 years later, when Christ is put on the cross and they mock him by putting the sign king of the Jews. Everything has significance. So then Herod calls together scribes and Pharisees as the opposition against Christ continues. They're opposing him. Some people are going to oppose Christ. But why would Herod want Jesus dead? Not only did Herod want him to be dead because Jesus had been given the title king of the Jews, Herod himself was not a full-blooded Jew. Technically, he was Idumean. I-D-U-M-E-A-N. Idumean. Which means that he would have been a descendant of Esau. 
So Herod came from the line of Esau. Don't you see this picture here? Don't you see this? The age-old struggle between Esau and Jacob that started before both of them were ever born. And like I was telling you earlier, Balaam prophesied and said, Hey, the stars are going to come. He was blessing the house of Jacob. That struggle is still going on. Guess what? If you have a problem with somebody, notice Jacob and Esau, they never got it right. They always struggled against each other. If you have a problem with somebody, why can't you clean that up tonight? Now, if you've done all that you can do, and you're waiting, the ball's on the other court, so to speak, pray about that. But if the ball's in your court, and you still haven't made it right with somebody else, make it right. Because if you see the line of Jacob and Esau, it festered for years and years and years. And they had problems with one another. And Esau still wanted to kill the line of Jacob. As Warren Wearsby said, it is the spiritual versus the carnal. The godly versus the worldly. The battle of life and death. I want to show you this from verses 4 through 6. Head knowledge does not equal heart change. So many of you are so smart. In different areas that God has given you, every single one of you is smart, every single one of you is wonderful, all that great stuff. But guess what? What you know cannot save you, but who you know saves you. You've got to know Jesus. Let me give you some definitions. Who are these scribes? Well, scribes are representing Jewish law. In other words, they are Jewish lawyers. Chief priests, they're corrupt, religiously oriented politicians. David Platt stated this about this passage. The spiritual state of the priest and the scribes is a sobering reminder that mere knowledge of the scriptures is not enough. You can know the text and miss the point. You can quote so much scripture. I mean, notice how these scribes and these chief priests, they go to him because Herod doesn't know the scripture. He's not a full-blooded Jew. He goes to them. He says, tell me what this means. And they immediately quote Micah 5.2. They pull it up. They show him Micah 5.2. They show him the prophecy of where Jesus is to be born. And don't you realize here that there was obviously no heart change because they knew where Christ was to be born. They had obviously heard the wise men had just told them that he had been born. They were following the star and the wise men did not move at or not or not the wise men but the pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests they did not move at all they read the scripture and they stayed where they were if they really had the heart change they would have been chasing and jumping over the wise men to meet the christ if they really had that relationship they would have been i'm going over there go with me get out of my way i've got to meet jesus But instead, they develop a plan to kill him. That's religion, not relationship. That's all that is. That's religion. And that's what religion will do for you. Look, I don't preach religion. I preach relationship. I've heard the phrase, I just miss the old time religion. What does that even mean? I know what that means in some context. But look, I don't want any kind of religion. I want relationship. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to lead my life. Spirit-filled living. So the Pharisee or these scribes and chief priests, they just don't get it. And that's sad. But that should immediately startle every believer in here. The fact that they knew they were where the Messiah was, but they didn't do anything about it. Many of you know who Jesus is. But have you done anything about it? Because if you know who he is, but he doesn't change your life, do you really know him? It's like that new song on the radio, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. You can tell somebody about Jesus all day long from the scripture. But when the rubber meets the road, are you willing to live for him and serve him? Lesson number three, this one's short. Some people scheme others. It's right there in the text. Verses 7 through 8. Herod, he's talking to the wise men. And if you notice here, we've got to beware of human deception. 
Herod is hiding under the facade of kindness. I'm pretty sure that... Uh, well, notice this too. Herod summoned the wise men secretly. I've missed that word every time I've read that passage. Secretly. Never forget that what is done in the dark will be brought to the light. There's a lot of psychology here. He wants the wise men to do his work for him. But he hides it under the facade of kindness. Because I'm sure Herod didn't go up to these well-known astrologers from the eastern lands and take a butcher knife and go, you're going to tell me where the Christ is or I'm going to slit your throat. I don't think he did that. I think it was a lot more deceptive. The word secret gives us that inclination. I believe that he probably gave them wine to drink. He probably gave them great food. He might have invited them in. None of this is in scripture. This is just my interpretation. What I think happened. And he said, hey, why don't you guys come back on your way home and let me know how it went. I want to worship him too. He sounds wonderful. That's probably how, about how it went. Because then you look at verses 13 and through the end of the chapter, you see how furious he was that they didn't do what he wanted them to do. That's deception. We must be careful and be aware of the human mind and listen to this and realize that not everyone has true intentions. Look, I want to assume that everybody has great intentions. But you can't do that anymore. But you can't ever do that. In the history of the world, since sin came in the world, we can't trust people's intentions. So Herod gets him out of the way, sends him six miles down the road, but his true intentions were to kill. Herod's true intentions were to kill, and as we see later on, he did do that. Matthew 2, 16 reveals us that Herod killed all the baby boys in Bethlehem under age 2. You can learn from this, the simple truth that you cannot outsmart God. You can't. Herod thinks he can. Herod thinks he can outsmart them. He can find Jesus. He can kill them. But you can't outsmart God. Lesson number four. Some people savor, some people savor the Savior's presence. The Savior's presence. Sing this with me. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I prove more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more did you catch that word precious wow Savor the Savior. Have you savored every moment you've been in the sanctuary tonight soaking up His Word? Or have you been thinking about leaving? I know that happens. I'm, I'm a little tired. I know that happens. I get it. But Jesus is so precious. And our time with Him is to be savored and treasured. The best conversation you can have in the day is to talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus makes everything right. We see that with the wise men here. They savor the Savior. If you haven't savored and soaked him up this Christmas season, you've missed the entire point. I love family. I love spending time with family. I love spending time with you. But Jesus is the reason for the season. One important thing to point out, this is most likely two years after the Christ. Okay, I want you to see this in verse 9. This is the first time in this passage in verse 9 that we actually see the star move. The star has physically moved. No, the wise men did not have GPS or a map or even a guide telling them where to go. Anybody that's been visiting with me before, I have to have a GPS. I'm going to pick on you, Bill. When I've ridden with Bill before, he'll say, I know where to go. We need to go this way, that way, and you know, teach me the roads and stuff. My mind does not work that way. Even in Greer, I use a GPS. 
I just have to. I have to do that. So I'm very glad that God allowed me to live in this century. I could not have survived then, okay? I really couldn't. Now, walking down the road with, with people trying to hijack me, I could beat them up, I think. I'm not worried about that. I'd be... <laughs> I'm not worried about that at all. I'm worried about GPS. I'm worried about getting lost. That's the worst feeling when you don't know where you're going. You know, if I'm ever late to visit you, if we have an appointment or something, I come to see you and I'm lost, please don't ask me why. It will embarrass me. It's not because I didn't leave in time or I forgot. It's because I got lost. Seriously. So the movement and the leading of the star immediately takes us back to the Old Testament. I want you to see this parallel from Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and that they might travel by day and by night. Now, I believe this was a star, but I think this is also symbolic that it could have also been a pillar. I don't think it was necessarily a pillar of a cloud, but it's the same concept here. That it was the star leading them. It was the pillar of cloud leading them. And the reason we have Christ today and the power of the Holy Spirit is to lead us. We need to let him. Where God leads, we must follow. And this is the, the theology aspect that no matter what scientists say or what science does or what they say about our minds and yada, 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 we got to do what God says all the time, anytime. God tells you to do, we must do. Also, when you see this in verse 10, how excited they were. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Let me tell you something. This is interesting. So they're seeing the star. It's in Bethlehem. They're getting ready to meet the Christ. And they rejoice exceedingly. We, as a church, need to rejoice exceedingly every time we have a worship service. Like we need to be pumped up and excited. I've heard people say, well, you just, you just have a lot of energy. That's why you're excited. No, I was dead in sin, heading to hell, and Jesus saved me. If you can't get excited about that, go home. Seriously. It's hard for me to look out in the crowd sometimes. I know people have resting faces, and I understand that. But smile back at me sometimes. It would really help me. It's hard sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, man, I just, I just don't have it today. I mean, you don't have to say a word. just Because Jesus saved you. If, if you have been saved by Jesus, that means that you are heading to hell. Now you are not. That should make you extremely happy. So they rejoice out of this excitement. We see in verse 11, they fall down to worship him. I don't know about you, but in your prayer time, sometimes does God ever bring you to your knees? That moment where you just hit the ground and, and you just pray? Y'all already know I do this, but sometimes I just get flat on my face. It's a lot easier for me to pray that way. I don't know why. It just is. But if we truly have an encounter with the Savior, our only response to Him would be to bow down and to worship Him. Come and worship. Come and worship. Come and worship Christ, the newborn king. It's like that choir song, Sherelle, that we've sung. Uh, For Jesus is worthy to be praised. That's why we can worship him. Okay, I want to talk to you about gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and I'm going to wrap up. So it was often in this period for in the ancient East for people to bring gifts when you were visiting someone that was superior to you. If I go to the President of the United States, I'm not going empty-handed. I'm going to bring him a First Baptist Church of Gaston flyer. Or something like that, you know. Some kind of gift, okay? A magnet. Yes, that are everywhere. <laughs> they make me so happy. I, get, I rejoice exceedingly when I see a magnet in the bathroom. Okay, anyway. That was supposed to be funny, but it wasn't. These wise men get it. These wise men understand. They get it that they, they would never under, that the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests would never understand simply because they hadn't believed in Jesus. But some commentators and theologians believe that these gifts have no symbolism, while others believe that they have great symbolism. So I'm not going to tell you necessarily what I believe, even though I kind of will. Um, 
I think they are symbolic. I really do. I think, I think God uses a lot of things in Scripture to be symbolic. And I think that here, the theologians that did that, obviously they were books, so I couldn't talk back to them, but I did anyway. I told them I thought they were wrong. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But I do want you to see this. Um, the first gift was gold. Now, what does that represent? I think it represents the royalty of Jesus. He's royal. Because if you look at 1 Kings chapter 10, you'll see that Solomon's wealth is described. Gold is mentioned ten times in seven verses when Solomon is talking about his wealth. What does that show? It shows royalty. What about frankincense? The deity of Christ. In the Old Testament, frankincense reverse refers to something related to worship or the service of God. You can reference Exodus 30, 34, or Leviticus 2, 1. Frankincense would be used when God is to be worshipped. And God was now incarnate. He was in human form, the Messiah, the great I am, in human form, the Messiah. What about myrrh? It represents Jesus' humanity. Humanity. Fully God, fully man. Myrrh was a perfume that was often associated with the anointing of a man. Jesus, here's a quote, Jesus was presented myrrh as a king in a cradle. Now, it's a little incorrect because he probably would have been a young child or possibly a toddler. But the, the point is the same. The very last lesson, I'm closing with this. Some people sabotage Satan's plans. Don't let Satan use you. See, the wise men came at a crossroads here. So... You know, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod. I believe God warned them in a dream. But I think it's interesting that it doesn't say the angel appeared to them in a dream or God told them in a dream. It just says and they were warned in a dream. So we're kind of left to assume that it was an angel or God or some form that, you know, did that dream. But obviously we don't know. Anyway, they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They departed to their own, own country by another route. So they had a huge, huge opportunity here to disobey this dream that I believe came from God, and they could have easily been used by Satan. Did you know that Christians or God or Satan can use Christians to hurt other Christians? And we're the ones that allow him to do that. We're the ones that allow him to use us, but we're also the ones that allow others that use him to hurt us. Hey, don't let Satan sabotage you. Why don't you sabotage his plans? Well, pow, you know, kick him in the face. Sabotage Satan's plans. How do we do that? Walk with God. Stay in tune with God. And be willing to listen when God wants to speak to you. Church, don't be swayed. Satan's schemes are going to look very attractive to us as human beings. Because they're rooted in sin. But we must not be swayed or conform. I believe we can learn from these five lessons about the human mind and how our natural sin can drive us to do some evil things. Even things we don't even mean to do. But also how God in His character has given us a way to be saved, which is Christ the Lord, which changes everything. Psychology and theology have met in this passage, but have you met with the Christ tonight? It is Christ who rules and who is supreme. By looking at the narrative of these wise men, we can learn life lessons when psychology and theology meet, such as some people seek the Savior, some people oppose the Savior, some people scheme others, some people savor the Savior's presence, and some people sabotage Satan's plans. I don't know what you're going through tonight. We're 10 days away from Christmas. I'm sure your mind's a little bit like mine. It's a little frazzled, a little razzle-dazzled, a little things going on, lots of things happening. But you need to meet with the Savior tonight. I know, seven minutes after eight, I think God can meet with us now, even if we're running overtime. Because guess what? It's all His time anyway. But I think it's important that we realize tonight and reflect on our human brain. And let's all admit it that we as human beings can be wrong. I'm wrong a lot of the time. A lot. But it's important that we allow God to pour into us 
and realize that, hey, we do need to seek the Savior. Some people are going to oppose Him. And we need to realize, especially when we were talking about the heart change, has your heart really changed? It's time for you. I want to encourage you, invite you. Don't you love how we have a full altar tonight? That's wonderful. I love that. Oh, I love those steps, as you could tell. Uh, I want to invite you to come down if you feel led to. Whatever you feel like God's tugging on your heart. It's our last sermon of the year. It's been an awesome year. God's done a lot of great things. But all this is in vain unless the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and is leading you every day. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for the opportunity to preach your word. God, I thank you for all these wonderful people that I've come to love so, so much who listen to your word and follow through in action in service in the ministry of this church. God, I thank you for each one of them. I thank you for how much they mean to me in my individual life and, and God, also how much they mean to their families. And God, if there's anybody here tonight that needs to come to know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would. God, maybe there's some people here tonight that need to come to this altar to pray. God, whatever we need to do, may we not leave this place without meeting with you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address, and you can contact us if you made a decision. Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life. Or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all to the glory of God.